Hello everyone, this is INT Japan. Yes, I changed my podcast name for a few reasons. I feel that this name reflects me more accurately as a person, and it's also easier to remember. Today's topic is about something that has piqued my interest for a long time, and not because of the game. I actually haven't played the game yet, but I'll get to it someday. So, without further ado, I'm going to talk about Yakuza, the Japanese mafia group. On April 24th, a ramen shop owner who was suspected to be the boss of a small Yakuza group was shot dead in his restaurant in Kobe. On Tabilog, his restaurant has a rating of 3.8 out of 5, which is considered really good for Japan. Japanese customers can be very tough when it comes to ratings and reviews. It's kind of a shame though. I'd really like to go to that ramen restaurant and have a Yakuza boss make me ramen. That would have been an interesting experience, don't you think? And yesterday, in much less dramatic news, two Yakuza members were arrested for entering Koshien Stadium to watch a baseball game. That's how serious Japan is with eradicating all Yakuza's from existence. So, what's so bad about them anyway? The Japanese Yakuza is a notorious organized crime syndicate that has been operating in Japan for over a century. While the group is often associated with violence and criminal activities, it is also a complex organization with a rich history and cultural significance. Some see them as the necessary evil in order to keep the Japanese society in order, but some have zero tolerance for it. It's only natural though, since Yakuza's can be very, very helpful or very, very cruel. Despite being illegal, the Yakuza's continues to exist and wield significant influences in various sectors of Japanese society, including business, politics, and entertainment. I was very surprised by how far-reaching their networks are. They even have their hands on pet shop businesses, and not because they're animal lovers, mind you. Any animal lover knows that animal rights in Japan is decades behind what it should be. So, a little crash course on the origins of Yakuza. I'm just going to quote an essay written by Adam Johnson because I couldn't have summarized it any better. The early Yakuza didn't surface until the middle to late 1700s. These members include the Bakuto, which are the traditional gamblers, and tekia, the street peddlers. These terms are still used today to describe Yakuza members, although a third group, gurentai, or hoodlums, has been added in the post-World War II era. Everyone in those groups came from the same background, poor, landless, delinquents, and misfits. The groups stuck closely in the same small areas without problems as the Bakuto remained mostly along the highways and towns and the Tekia operated in the markets and fairs of Japan. The Yakuza eventually began organizing into families, and group members united with each other for mutual protection. They began to control booths at fairs and markets and developed a reputation for scamming people out of their money. They also played a role in Japan's gambling tradition. In the 1800s, the Yakuza began to modernize. They started recruiting members from construction and dock jobs, and even began to control the rickshaw business. Some of the group members became involved in politics, taking sides with certain politicians and officials. They cooperated with the government so they could get leverage and special treatment. In the 1900s, American occupation forces in post-war Japan saw the Yakuza as a primary threat to their work. The Yakuza had ties to Japanese politicians and government officials, which allowed them to exert significant influence over government institutions. So by then, Yakuza already planted its roots everywhere inside Japan. This made it difficult for the military to carry out their work and enforce the rule of law in Japan. Not only that, the Yakuza annoyed the hell out of the American military by infiltrating the black market, which was a significant source of goods and services in post-war Japan. The Yakuza controlled much of the black market, sold things at ridiculous prices, and used their influence to extract bribes and protection payments from those who wished to do business inside the market. 
This made it difficult for the military to procure supplies and services, and it also undermined their efforts to establish a stable and democratic society in Japan. Between 1958 and 1963, the number of group members rose by more than 150% to 184,000 members. Approximately 5,200 Yakuza gangs operating throughout Japan began to stake out their territories and violent gang wars occurred. These gangs controlled many businesses, gambling and loan sharking, and invested heavily in sports and other entertainment. They also became involved in drugs, money lending, smuggling, and pornography. So this sum up the general history of Yakuza in Japan. Sounds like a fun bunch, don't they? By the early 20th century, they had become organized into larger criminal syndicates. It is at this point that the term Yakuza began to be used to refer to these criminal organizations. Now, on to the structure of the Yakuza. It's actually a little bit complicated. The Yakuza is a hierarchical organization with a complex structure that includes several different levels of membership. Imagine Scientology, because it kind of sounds like it in a way. At the top of the hierarchy is the Oyabun, or Godfather, who is the leader of the organization. The Oyabun has complete control over his subordinates, and they are expected to show complete loyalty and obedience to him. I'm using him because all Oyabuns are men. That's one of Yakuza's traits. It's a very, very macho world. Many of them were afraid of catching coronavirus because they were worried they'd be seen as a wuss by their comrades. So if you have ever watched any Yakuza movie where the low-ranking Yakuza kneel on the floor with their heads bowed low, they are not very far off. Below the Oyabun are the Kumicho, or the family bosses who are responsible for managing individual branches of the Yakuza. The Kumicho are the ones who oversee the day-to-day -day operation of the organization and they are responsible for enforcing the rules and resolving disputes within their branch. So like a branch manager in a typical company. Actually, the whole setup reminds me of a typical Japanese company. Beneath the kumicho are the wakagashira, or underbosses, who are responsible for managing the lower level members of the organization. The wakagashira are the ones who oversee the activities of the foot soldiers and other lower level members. So these are the supervisors, I'm guessing. At the very bottom of the hierarchy are the kobun or foot soldiers, who are the rank and file members of the organization, the little pawns on a chessboard. The kobun are responsible for carrying out the criminal activities of the yakuza. This can include collecting debts, providing protection services, beating people up, or intimidating rival organizations or individuals who pose a threat to the Yakuza's interest. And Kobuns are expected to show complete loyalty and obedience to their superiors, despite them having to do all the dirty work. This is how the powerful Yakuza bosses manage to keep their hands clean and escape arrests. The Kobuns even have to pay up every month, and the ones that don't get weeded out. So why would people volunteer to do someone else's dirty work anyway? Kobuns are expected to be loyal to their Oyabun and to follow orders without question. They are also expected to show respect and deference to their Oyabun and to the other senior members of the organization. In return, they receive protection and support from the Yakuza and may be provided with various benefits, such as access to loans or assistance with finding employment. Believe it or not, many of these junior Yakuza members hide their membership and work normal jobs during the day. After all, Kobuns don't earn a lot of money. Kobuns are often initiated into the Yakuza through a formal ceremony called a Sakazuki. During the ceremony, the Kobun drink sake with the Oyabun and swear allegiance to the organization. The Kobun is then given Irezumi, which is basically a tattoo unique to Yakuza, which symbolizes their membership in the organization and their commitment to its values and tradition. 
It also symbolizes their pain endurance because they believe that if you can withstand the pain of getting a tattoo, then you are also strong mentally. There is something a little bit romantic about their tradition and their sense of loyalty to each other. It's not something that modern society values nowadays. People hardly ever fight for each other out of kinship. In Japan, while being considerate of others is considered a virtue, at the end of the day, being considerate and being helpful are two different things. To simplify, you don't bother me, I don't bother you. You live your life, I live mine. You deal with your problems and I deal with mine. It's a lonely society. As of 2023, the number of Yakuza members have dwindled significantly. Whereas in 2011, Japan counted over 80,000 members, the number stood at roughly 24,000 in 2022. Over 35% of this Yakuza population, however, belongs to the largest Yakuza syndicate in Japan, Yamaguchi-gumi. While other Yakuza groups see their numbers shrink, Yamaguchi-gumi is the only one who has gained 300 new members since 2020. Despite this increase though, it is unlikely that Yamaguchi Gumi will return to its former glory. Majority of the Yakuza members are over 50 years old. The young recruits are less inclined to stay with the gang and leave with the new year. This is mainly due to the Japanese government's effort to eradicate the Yakuza groups entirely. In 1992, the Japanese government passed the Anti-Organized Crime Law which made it illegal to provide funds or other assistance to organized crime groups. The law also made it easier for the government to seize assets and take other measures to disrupt the activities of these groups. In 2011, the Japanese government passed a law that made it illegal to do business with organized crime groups including the Yakuza. The law requires companies to conduct background checks on their business partners and to sever ties with any group found to be associated with organized crime. The government has also increased penalties for crimes committed by members of the Yakuza. In the same year, the government passed a law that made it illegal to pay protection money to the Yakuza, with penalty including fines and imprisonment. In addition, the government has established a special police unit, the so-called Organized Crime Control Division, to investigate and prosecute organized crime groups including the Yakuza. Still, these laws prove to have a lot of loopholes. To date, some estimates claim that the Yakuza received 10-20% to of Japan's public works budget. This amounts to roughly $50 billion annually. To illustrate a white elephant regional airport development project that cost billions of dollars and was apparently carried out in cooperation with and for the benefit of a well-known Yakuza lord. Additionally, Kansai International Airport construction was reportedly a huge financial gain for the Yakuza. In the early 2000s, the government launched an initiative to support Japanese companies. In order to promote small and mid-sized businesses, the government offered them $2 billion US dollars support fund, which of course ended up being a gold mine for the Yakuza. All they had to do was create a fake company, apply for funds, and ta-da, they're $1 million richer. Don't try this at home, please. Of course, some Yakuza also own legitimate businesses acquired through illegal means like intimidation, extortions, and blackmailing. And with businesses, you need employees, so that means Yakuza contribute to reducing the unemployment rate in Japan and boosting the overall economy. Imagine how many jobs would be lost if all Yakuza-affiliated businesses were to be shut down. Some experts argue that the efforts to combat the Yakuza should focus on reducing their power and influence rather than trying to completely eliminate them. Kind of like removing weeds from your garden. It doesn't matter how much you pluck them if you leave the roots in, you need to go herbicides on those things. But how would one reduce their power and influence? Considering that Yakuza's have a lot of networks, it will be like opening a can of worms. Dismantling one part of Yakuza might cause an unwanted dominoes effect because 
Well, the Yakuza have a significant impact on the Japanese economy and to an extent some influence on the Japanese government. I think people deny this because it's better for their conscience. Ignorance is bliss after all. For example, will Japan just close down all the pachinkos run by Yakuza? One of the most significant sources of income for the Yakuza is gambling. The organization operates a vast network of illegal gambling dens, which are usually in the back rooms of bars and restaurants like the ones you see in movies. These ventures generate billions of dollars in revenue each year. In April 2023, the Japanese government finally gave the green light to opening a casino in Hiroshima. Of course, many people are still opposed to legalizing gambling, but the Japanese government is hoping to boost tourism and the economy brought on by tourism. However, this also means that the Yakuza might try to get involved in the casino, which might strengthen their influence even more. They are already known to run many pachinkos all over Japan. Pachinko is a type of Japanese arcade game that is similar to a pinball or slot machines. Instead of winning money, however, which is illegal, you win balls or prizes that you can later exchange for money outside the pachinko. It's basically the roundabout version of a casino. The Yakuza then use the profits to fund their other more profitable but illegal businesses like drug trafficking. The Yakuza's are also involved in other forms of gambling such as horse racing, boat racing, and even sports betting. They often use their criminal influence to manipulate the outcomes of these events, ensuring that they win large sums of money. For example, they might pay players to throw the game or straight up threaten them with violence. Another source of income that Yakuza is notorious for is prostitution. It is a well-known fact that they run a large number of brothels, hostess clubs, soap lands, and escort services. In fact, I used to live 5 minutes away from those places. The practice of enjo kosai involves young girls being paid for socializing with older men. The yakuza serve as intermediaries in these transactions and of course they take a cut of the profits. Not only that, yakuza are also notorious for human trafficking. They often bring women from foreign countries to work in the sex industry in Japan, especially from Thailand. And the working conditions for these women are often inhumane. These women were led to Japan under false pretenses that they would be earning a lot of money. Of course, some of the women already knew this and they kind of accepted their fate because some of them are desperate for money or they just want to escape from their abusive household. Of course, the government has begun to crack down on prostitution by imposing stricter penalties, but from what I've seen, these businesses are still thriving in Japan. Logically, it makes little sense to join a group that forces you to commit crimes and pay up every month to maintain your membership. It kind of reminds me of Om Shinrikyo. Members also had to pay certain fees every month and many of them did a lot of shady things for their leaders. However, for some people, joining the Yakuza seems to be the only way. There are several reasons for this. 1. For some people, joining the Yakuza may be a way to escape poverty or financial struggles. The Yakuza can provide members with a stable income and access to resources that may not be available otherwise. People who have large debts or cannot find a job because of their background, such as criminal record, have no choice but to work for the Yakuza. In Japan, it's very difficult to find a job if you have a criminal record. Reason number two. In some cases, joining the Yakuza may be seen as a way to gain social status or respect within certain communities. I'm not sure what communities these are exactly, but I'm pretty sure I'm lucky enough not to be in any of them. Reason number three. Some people may join the Yakuza for protection from other criminal groups or from individuals who may pose a threat to them or their families. The Yakuza's are known for their loyalty to their members and are often willing to go to great lengths to protect them. I guess this is one of the employee benefits that you can't get in normal companies. And reason number four is kind of a psychological one. For some individuals, joining the Yakuza may provide a sense of belonging and comradeship that they may not have found elsewhere. 
The Yakuza have a strong sense of brotherhood and loyalty, and this can be appealing to those who feel isolated or disconnected from society. That's why orphaned or abused children become an easy target for Yakuza headhunters. 5. And this one I find it kind of sad. Children who were born into a Yakuza family are unlikely to get a job in a normal company. They may be decent people, but companies don't want to be associated with Yakuza in any way because it's bad for business. Besides, it would be hard to escape a Yakuza family considering their peculiar way of life. Not only have these children been trained to honor the Yakuza codes all their life, they have probably been brainwashed into believing and following these codes. It's like bros before hoes, but in this case, bros before everything else. There are a lot of factors that make it difficult for Yakuza members to leave the gang though, especially if they have lost a lot of things during the membership. I'm talking about the psychological aspect as well, considering that the infamous punishment for a rogue Yakuza is chopping off the top joint of their little fingers. There is a lot of emotions and commitment riding on their membership. In psychology, they call it sunk cost policy. This is when we make a decision based on how much time, money, or effort we have already spent on something, rather than what's best for us now. Imagine you buy a ticket to go to the cinema, but when the day comes, you don't really feel like going. You might think, ah, but I've already paid for the tickets, so I might as well go. But that's not really true. You should decide if going to the cinema is still a good idea based on how much you want to see the movie, not just because you already paid for it. And that's what you call sunk cost fallacy. Whatever a person's reason is to join this notorious group, we'll never fully understand. And it's a good thing we don't. A reporter for Asahi Shinbun interviewed an ex-Yakuza member who retired in his 70s. The picture for retired Yakuza's is not a pretty one. So any of you who are considering joining the group, I hope this will change your mind. To quote the ex Yakuza, While I do feel as though I have managed to somehow survive until now, I would not join a gang if I was born again, the ex Yakuza said. I went to prison three times, now I have no family, no savings, and no job. While that may have been a payback for half a century as a Yakuza, I have no idea how to go on living since I could not even pay my rent. You think that leaving a Yakuza group is as simple as walking out the door and going off radar, but it's actually quite formal. First, you need an official document from the Yakuza group that you belong to, stating that you are no longer a member. After that, you take the safe document to the police station, hoping that the police will remove you as a registered gang member from their database. Now, even if you are no longer a member, it doesn't mean you can live a normal life. When you are already in your 60s or 70s, your job prospect will decline drastically. To support yourself, you might need to apply for welfare assistance, but the thing is, you will most likely be rejected because of your past record as a Yakuza member. The ex-Yakuza in the interview said that his welfare application has been rejected three times, all for the same reason, because of his past as a Yakuza. The Yakuza has a unique relationship with Japanese society. While the organization is illegal, it is not completely shunned by the public. In fact, many Japanese people see the Yakuza as a necessary evil, providing protections and enforcing a certain code of conduct in areas where the police might not be able to. One notable case study of the Yakuza is the Kobe earthquake in 1995. The earthquake, which measured 7.2 on the Richter scale, struck Kobe and caused widespread damage and a lot of casualties. In the aftermath of the earthquake, the Yakuza provided aid and assistance to the victims. They used their extensive networks and resources to provide food, water, and medical supplies to those affected by the disaster. They also helped to evacuate people from the affected areas and provided temporary shelter for those who had lost their homes. The Yakuza's response to the Kobe earthquake was praised by many in Japan, who saw it as an example of their willingness to help those in need and their commitment to the communities in which they operated. Some even argued that the Yakuza efforts were more effective than those of the government, which is embarrassing. 
which was criticized for its slow response to the disaster. Of course, Yakuza might just be doing this for clouds. For those who have lived here for a while, you've probably come across a few Yakuza. They often sport a flashy suit, a big chain around their neck, has funky hairstyles or shaved head, and of course, the most telling sign is the large tattoo that often cover their arms, neck, back, or even face. They often frequent Sento, which is a kind of public bus that is apparently a thing here. Of course, many establishments prohibit Yakuza from using their facilities, and some hot springs also prohibit people with tattoos from entering. But some older establishments are more tolerant as long as the Yakuza don't cause any troubles, and they usually don't. Yakuza may be dangerous, but they are more of a threat towards big businesses and the wealthy. For ordinary folks like me, they probably don't care. If you want to know more about Yakuza in general, Jake Adelstein is your guy. He has been a Yakuza expert for 25 years. His book, Tokyo Vice, is definitely worth a read if you want to know the dark side of Japan. Because of his discoveries, the Yakuza world that was once mysterious has become a lot more transparent. His reporting also led to several high-profile arrests like the arrest of Tadamasa Goto, the leader of Gotogumi. This is also why he gets a lot of death threats from the Yakuza. If a Yakuza feels threatened by you, you know you're a real deal. As always, kite kureta mina arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you for listening. See you next time.